Honourable Members, the President. Members, are there any questions? The, thank you. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question, without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education and Training. I refer to the Minister's joint media statement on 5 August on the Government Skills Summit and the Government's Apprenticeship and Training Policy, and I ask for each of the following financial years, A 2016-17, B 17-18, 18-19, 19-20 and 2021. 1. How many apprenticeships were commenced in Western Australia? 2. How many apprenticeships were completed in Western Australia? 3. How many people were in apprenticeships in Western Australia? 4. How many traineeships were commenced in Western Australia? 5. How many traineeships were completed in Western Australia? And 6. How many people were in traineeships in Western Australia? The Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Um, uh, President, the Honourable Member is asking for a series of, uh, obviously, numbers um, over a series of years. So can I ask to have that part of the answer incorporated into Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you. And then there is a note down the bottom. In December 2017, the state government removed the payroll tax exemption for existing worker trainees due to rorting of the exemption to minimise tax obligations by some businesses. This resulted in existing worker traineeships declining by around 80 per cent over the next two years. New entrant traineeships remained steady over the same time frame. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my uh, question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. I refer to the 2019 to 2021 boom of iron ore prices and I ask, one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by Treasury? Two, what was the iron ore royalty revenue received in the 2021 financial year? Three, what is the actual dollar and percentage decline in the iron ore price since I last asked this question on the 24th of June this year? Four, does Treasury expect this decline to continue and if so, to what extent? And five, what is the McGowan government's economic plan for the end of the current mining boom? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President. Thursday afternoon, I love them. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notes to the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Treasurer. Uh, one, US $162 per tonne. Two, the audited iron ore royalty revenue collections for the 2021 financial year will be disclosed in the annual report and state finances released in September. Three, the iron ore price has declined by $54.20, uh, or 25 per cent, since the Honourable Member's question, Legislative Council question without notice 359 on the 24th of June 2021, highlighting the volatility in the iron ore price and the need to budget accordingly. Four, Treasury's commentary of the iron ore market will be provided in the 2021-22 budget. Five, the McGowan government has committed around $8 billion as part of the WA recovery plan and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. This has provided resourcing for our frontline services, support for businesses and households, and significant investments to drive our state's economic recovery and create jobs. The McGowan, Go McGowan government continues to make record investments in infrastructure to boost employment and opportunities for local businesses and to improve services and support growth over the long term. The Honourable Yorn Sidmer. Thank you, President. My question, without notice, of which some notice is provided, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. And I refer to your recent comments that the government might possibly enact the net zero emissions by 2050 target in law. And I ask one, do your comments ruling in the possibility of a legislative net zero target represent an official change in policy that your government took to the last election, including assurances provided previously to stakeholders? Two, were your cabinet colleagues, including the Minister for Energy, aware that you would put out a legislated target on the public agenda prior to you making those remarks? Three, at what point will you make the decision to legislate for a target and upon what information will you rely on forming this position? And four, should you decide to legislate a 2050 target, what consultation process will you initiate prior to drafting a bill? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. It's not in my file, Honourable Member, and I don't actually recall signing off on it. But if it does come in before the end of question time, I'll give you the answer. The Honourable Nick Guerin. President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to your answer to the question without notice number 106 on 12 May 2021, in which you advised the review of amendments introduced by the Criminal Appeals Amendment Double Jeopardy Act 2012 was nearing completion. And I ask one, on what date did this review commence? Two, on what date is this review scheduled to be completed? And three, when will the report on this review be tabled? 
Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, the review commenced in April 2018. Two, the review is scheduled to be completed in September 2021. Three, the report will be tabled as soon as practical after the completion of the review. The Honourable Donna Farragher. <laughs> And President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the answer given to question without notice 468 asked yesterday. As the Minister chose not to provide a specific response to my question regarding child health nurses, I ask again, one, can the Minister confirm whether any community child health nurses have been redeployed to COVID-19 vaccination clinics, and if so, how many? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. One, it is not possible to provide the requested information in the time required because the regions will need to manually review this data. I therefore ask the honourable member to place this question on notice. The honourable Peter Collier. Thank you, President. My question, without notice, which some is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health. I refer the Minister to question C488, asked on Wednesday, the 11th of August, to the Minister for Police, and to the announcement on Sunday to inject $4 billion to reboot Western Australia's health system. And I ask one, will the Minister commit to fund the ongoing services of the Soldiers and Sirens program, which provides essential mental health services and support for WA Police, other first responders, and veterans? And if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, uh, President, and thank you, Honourable Member. Uh, I was disappointed to hear that the federal government funding for soldiers and sirens has not been continued, and I do call on the federal minister to reconsider this decision. As you would appreciate, Honourable Member, uh, there is a requirement to adhere to the WA State Government procurement rules when undertaking any community services procurement activity to ensure a competitive open market pro procurement process is undertaken. The Mental Health Commission has an unsolicited funding proposal process, and soldiers and sirens have been provided with information to enable them to submit an application for assessment under this process. Uh, the Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister of Housing, C532. I refer to the public housing wait list and I ask how many people were on the public housing wait list at the end of June and July, respectively? Two, of the people in one, how many received a disability support pension? Three, how many people were on the public housing priority wait list at the end of June and July, respectively? And four, of the people in three, how many receive the disability support pension? Thank you. The Leader of the House. Thanks, <clears throat> President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Um, one to two, as at the 30th of June 2021, there were 16,194 applications on the public housing wait list. Of this, 3,293 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. As at 31 uh, July 2021, there were 17,320 applications on the public housing wait list. Um, of this, 3,312 3, had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. Three to four. As at 30 June 2021, there were 3,354 applications on the public housing priority wait list. Of this, 826 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. As at 31 July 2021, there were 3,478 applications on the priority public housing wait list. Of this, 857 applications had household members in receipt of a disability support pension or payment. These wait list figures are well below the numbers seen under the previous Barnett Liberal National Government, which peaked at 24,136 in 2009-10. The Honourable Sophia Mamont. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney-General. I refer the Minister to the harm minimisation strategies, priority substances and priority populations outlined in the Australian Government's National Drug Strategy 2017 and 2026, and I ask one, how many West Australians are currently incarcerated for cannabis-related crimes? Um, are female Indigenous adults, are male Indigenous adults, or are Indigenous minors? Thank you. Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. It is not possible to provide the member with a response within the time available, and I ask the member to place this question on notice. 
More generally, requests for statistical information may require the agency to manually search through individual records or files which may or may not be held off-site before the agency is able to comply with an answer. Every effort is made to answer questions without notice in the limited time available. However, it is for the above reasons that I have previously asked the member to place such questions on notice and do so again today. The Hon. Brian Walker. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Local Government. I refer the Minister to his response to my earlier question, number 194, of the 1st of June 2021, on the review of the Cemeteries Act, and I ask, which key stakeholders were invited to contribute to the early targeted stakeholder consultation? And two, given their vocal and consistent public protests around renewal over the past five years, why was the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group not included in that initial contact? The Leader of the House. President, thank you, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, as part of the Cemeteries and Cremation Act review, the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, DLGSC, has invited contributions to early targeted consultation from various relevant stakeholders. As this consultation is ongoing, a list of key stakeholders contacted thus far is provided. And, President, there is a list which I seek to have incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you. Two, as part of this consultation, the DLGSC sent email correspondence to representatives of the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group during May of this year, inviting contributions from the group. The Minister for Local Government also encouraged the Saving Family Headstones at Karakata Group to make a submission to the review in correspondence dated 20 July 2021. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Uh, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to the Government's Health Workforce Recruitment Strategy announced on 10 August and noting recent reports of the midwife from South Australia with a contract to work at Kalgoorlie Health Campus has consistently been denied entry to WA, while an influx of over 200 health workers from high-risk jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom and Ireland, are set to arrive in WA and ask one. Will the state government consider providing incentives, including supporting the cost of quarantine requirements for interstate healthcare workers wishing to relocate to WA? Two, is your department aware of any other contracts being accepted by interstate healthcare workers willing to relocate to WA but unable to obtain a G2G pass for entry? Three, what are you and your department doing to assist those healthcare workers identified in two? And four, have you raised concerns regarding G2G applications from key healthcare workers directly with the Minister for Police? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, the following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I am advised the Department of Health is not able to provide the requested information in the time required, and I therefore ask the Honourable Member to place this question on notice. Honourable Member, I've just seen this now for the first time. There are some parts of it that I think could be answered next week, so I undertake to uh, see, at the very least, if I can have parts of it answered next week and to provide to you. The Hon. James Hayward. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the practical driving assessments and answers to question 399C435, and I ask, one, does the Department of Transport allow video recordings of heavy vehicle driving tests? Uh, uh, two, if yes to one, uh, why? Uh, is video recording of driving tests allowed for heavy vehicle licences and not for C-class licences? Three, in response to question 339, the Minister advised third-party cameras were not allowed to be used during driving tests due to technical, privacy and liability issues. Can the Minister please outline what the justification for their response in more detail? And four, would the use of um, third... If, would the use of non-third-party cameras address technical privacy and liability issues? And if so, does the minister support using department-owned video technology to record driving tests? Leader of the House. President, thank you, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question one to two. The Department of Transport has a contract with heavy vehicle assessors to conduct assessments on behalf of the department. Cameras were rolled out following recommendations from a previous uh, C investigation that found a number of heavy vehicle drivers were being licensed without having their competence adequately assessed at a former truck driving school in 2015. This footage is only accessible if a significant breach of assessment is identified as part of the Department of Transport's audit regime. This is not the case with C-class licence assessments. 
3 to 4, the answer to question without notice 399 stated that the use of private or third party cameras would raise technical privacy and liability issues. This is because C-class assessments are undertaken in privately owned vehicles. There are adequate audit regimes in place to ensure the consistency of assessments conducted and to assist with providing feedback to candidates. Uh, the Hon. Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. My question without notice, uh, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. And I refer to the response to uh, LCQWN 475 asked yesterday related to the practice of transfer of foreign seafarers to shore and onto outbound aircraft in Port Hedland International Airport. And I asked by way of clarification if the Minister says, referring to a 14 day quarantine period, that it is not a WA health requirement for international seafarers to undertake a two-week quarantine period on board a vessel prior to transfer off the vessel, as this would not guarantee that, not, uh, uh, that there is not a COVID-19 outbreak on board the vessel. How does the minister guarantee there is no infection of COVID-19 among seafarers when they are being transferred through the community of Port Hedland? And two, as the minister says, uh, seafarers are not required to be tested prior to disembarkation if the vessel has been granted critique and the crews on board are well, when are the seafarers tested? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. <laughs> One, WA Health managed COVID-19 risks of international seafarers by mandating the use of infection prevention and control measures for both seafarers and transport workers through the maritime crew directions and the transport and accommodation services exposure maritime worker directions. These directions stipulate various requirements, including that travel must occur via a dedicated conveyance for international seafarers and strict infection prevention and control measures are applied. Two, testing is arranged by the Department of Health for international seafarers where there is concern of COVID-19 illness on a vessel. Uh, the Hon. Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Minister's comments on the public housing program in the Geraldton suburb of Spalding and I ask, one, when will the, pro uh, the program public housing in Spalding be announced? Two, how many, homes, sorry, how many houses in the program is expected to deliver? And three, when is the program expected to be completed? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable uh, member for some notice of the question. One to three, the McGowan government is acutely aware of the issues regarding uh, the Geraldton suburb of Spalding and visited the area recently. The minister is actively progressing a range of options to return social housing stock across the state, including in Spalding. In progressing these options, the minister continues to work with a range of stakeholders, including the city of Greater Geraldton. The Honourable Steve Thomas. I'm uh, sorry, the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, I have to answer to anything just about President. Um, thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to the Wave Energy Research Centre in Albany, which was announced in 2017 at the same time as the failed $15.75 million Carnegie Energy project, opened on the November, in November 2019 and was funded by $3.7 million Royalties for Regions grant. And I ask one, how much of the $3.5 million has now been acquitted? Two, how much of the $3.5 million is unspent? Three, what research papers or other outcomes has, has the Wave Energy Research Centre delivered? Four, how will the government measure the success or failure of this project and has that turnover should been made? And five, apologies for the spelling mistake, based on the research of the centre, will the government invest in Wave Energy projects in Albany in the future? Minister for Regional Development. Well, I, I thank the member for this question, but I just want to uh, uh, set the context because uh, some people could be led into error by the uh, uh, by the some of the provocative uh, uh, features of the uh, of the question. So, just to set the record straight, uh, we uh, we had a common user infrastructure project with Carnegie when Carnegie went into temporary uh, administration. We terminated that contract. We uh, paid a total of uh, $1.4 million um, in respect of the early work that was done on that project. And that information, all of the data and studies that were paid for um, in that $1.4 million, are now a public resource and provide uh, useful uh, information for energy and shipping industries. Uh, so our government's support for the marine energy sector, and in particular our $3.5 million investment in the UWA, 
uh, Energy Research Centre has been actually a great success story. The centre currently employs more than 30 researchers, supports a knowledge hub for wave, tidal and offshore energy industries, as well as a research facility to support large-scale commercial deployments of off offshore renewable energy. The centre also supports research for local marine-based industries. The project is still active and funding won't be acquitted until the completion of the project. And I understand there is only around um, uh, $3,000 yet to be, uh, to be granted. But the member will be incredibly pleased to know that to date there has been 43 peer-reviewed research papers that have been published by the members of the centre. Uh, and of note, three common user resource data sets related to the wave energy resource and coastal conditions at the Torbay site are available to the public and wave energy developers at the centre's website. And uh, just last year, researchers from the centre were selected to join the newly established Blue Economy Cooperative Research Centre, a federal government initiative investigating the sustainable use of uh, ocean resources to drive economic uh, growth. Um, there has the FAA agreement that was signed between the state government and UWA for the uh, centre specifies that there will be um, key performance indicators, a report on key performance indicators, looking at scientific research, community outreach, industry engagement and regional uh, impact when the project is fully completed. Uh, and all indications to date, as I said, 43 peer-reviewed research papers plus numerous um, uh, community engagement exercises, I have no doubt it will be judged a success. And five, the research is telling us that there is a potential for wave and other offshore energy systems to play a role in decarbonising our economy, and we remain open to all opportunities. The Honourable Yorn Sibmar. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice is provided, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, uh, question C480. And I refer to your April 14 media statement, uh, quote, important staffing boost for WA hospitals, and I ask, one, how many of the 1,000 newly qualified nurses committed to in the release have been employed to date? Two, of those, how many have been offered and accepted either A, permanent full-time contracts or B, short-term contracts? Three, how many reside in Western Australia? And four, how many have relocated from either A, interstate or B, overseas? The Minister for Mental Health. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, 949 newly qualified nurses and midwives, NQNM. 2A NIL are still in their transition to practice program, TPP. 2B, 949, all NQNM are offered fixed term contracts. They, these are usually 12 months that range from 0 0.6 FTE minimum to full time while they complete their TPP. 3, 949. Uh, 4A, five midwives, Queensland and Northern Territory, B NIL. The Honourable Nick Guerin. That notice of which some notice has been given this to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the Government's announcement on 6 January 2021, committing $37.2 million to the Home Stretch program. And I ask one, how much of this funding has been allocated to date? Two, which organisations are recipients of this funding? Three, how many young people left care in 2020-2021? in the, that reporting period. Four, how many of the young people identified in three are supported by the Home Stretch Program? And five, how many young people are supported by the Home Stretch Program in total? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Child Protection. One to two, the announcement in January 2021 was an election commitment. Funding of election commitments is being considered through the 2021-22 state budget process, which is currently underway. Details regarding funding allocation will be available after the release of the 2021-22 state budget. The Department of Communities will undertake a procurement process to determine the most appropriate recipients across the funding period. Three, 897, four, five, supported through the current home stretch trial. Five, there are 15 places available for allocation to young people 
in the community's funded home stretch trial in the Fremantle district. In 2020-2021, two young people turned 21 and aged out of the trial. As at the 30th of June 2021, there were 13 active participants. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, President. President, my question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to question without notice 173, asked on the 27th of May 2021, regarding the trial of a new $1.2 million culturally and linguistically diverse early years link program. And I ask one: Can the minister confirm whether this funding has been approved by the department? has been provided sorry, by the Department of Education, and two, if no to one, which department has provided the funding? The Leader of the House. Member, for some notice of the question, one yes, two not applicable. The Hon. Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, notice which some notice is given is being redirected to the Minister for Mental Health. Um, I refer the Minister to the media statement of 7 May 2019, titled McGowan Government Takes Action on Methamphetamine Issues, and asks one, has a 10-bed crisis centre been established in Midland? If not, why not? Two, if yes to one, uh, what was the total cost of the crisis centre? Three, has a $9.2 million comprehensive alcohol and other drugs youth service been established in the Kimberley? If not, why not? And two, if yes to three, what was the total cost of the youth service? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Honourable Member, the question that was submitted to me did have uh, 7 May 2021, but of course my, off my office went back and found the 2019 press release, and so have answered it with that date in mind. Okay. Um, so one, uh, a six-bed facility was opened in April 2021. Ten beds were not possible due to the physical limitations of the existing building that was renovated to accommodate the Midland Withdrawal and Intervention Centre. Two, 759,000 for capital and 4.8 million dollars recurrent. 0.2 million in 2019-20. Uh, 1.53 million in 2020-21. 1.546 million in 2021-22, and 1.562 million dollars in 2022-23. Uh, three, no, the Mental Health Commission has undertaken a comprehensive co-design process with local stakeholders in the development of the service model, which was significantly delayed due to travel restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Mental Health Commission is currently developing the procurement plan for the service. Four, the total cost of the service is yet to be established. However, the allocated budget for the Kimberley Youth Alcohol and Drug Service is $21 million. Uh, $3.264 million in 2021-22, $5.954 million in 2022-23, $5.954 million in 2023-24, and $5.954 million in 2024-25. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the media statement issued on July 7, 2021, titled Boost for Emergency Services in Local Communities, which states, and I quote, McGowan Government delivers on election commitments for emergency services, end quote, and I ask one, how has this $310,000 election commitment been funded? Two, was any component of the $310,000 in funding provided through the emergency services levy? And three, if yes to two, please detail which projects were funded and the amount of emergency service levy allocated to each project. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. <clears throat> One, this was funded through consolidated appropriation. Two, no. Three, not applicable. The honourable James Hayward. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to support services for the ageing in Collie uh, and the community resource centres. And I ask: One, has the minister received a request to establish a community resource centre in Collie? If yes, to one. Uh, was the request approved? If no, to two. Why not? Uh, how many new uh, community resource centres have been established since April 2017, and where were they established? The uh, I, thank the, development. Uh, I thank the member for the question. Um, I have not received a submission. Um, I am aware that uh, there has been a, uh, a, uh, a constituent of Collie who has uh, contacted the local member uh, and written to a minister about um, the problems that aged people are having with IT. Uh, in Collie, um, including interactions with Telstra, um, and the letter that I've seen certainly wasn't a, a request for a CRC. Uh, there was a request for a CRC uh, in, inquiry made by um, a, a, a service provider, a, a, a commercial service provider that tends to use CRCs in the southwest, as to whether 
uh, there was one in Collie, so they could uh, use that CRC to deliver their services um, that they are uh, paid to deliver by the uh, Commonwealth. But we, uh, uh, there isn't a, uh, a CRC um, application being considered for Collie. Collie is um, uh, considerably larger than any other town that. Uh, Sign from Broom, which is special circumstances that has a uh, has a CRC. Uh, the only new uh, application that we uh, are looking at is for one in um, uh, mining and pastoral region. The vast majority of the uh, CRCs are in the southwest, so there is quite a disproportionate arrangement. So we're not at this point considering that, um, but we are talking to. Um, uh, uh, Minister Don Punch, who's Minister for Seniors and for IT, about what services might be available or programs to enhance IT skills for seniors. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister Epson and the Minister for Planning, and I refer to concerns raised by residents of Subiaco, including previous four mayors of Subiaco about plans for the property development for up to 6,000 new residents at the Subi East redevelopment. And I ask, how does the Minister for Planning propose to ensure there is adequate playing fields facilities for the Bob Hawke College on the site adjoining the sites, noting the requirements of the state planning policy? Two, is the Minister aware of the concerns of the residents, parents and the PNC Association about the safety of children due to the proximity and intensity of apartment and commercial developments, and what measures have been taken to address these concerns? Three, has Development WA undertaken traffic modelling as a result of the proposed development, including at peak times during school pickup? And if yes, can the minister table that modelling? And for what is the most recent estimate, uh, estimated net value of this to, to the state of the proposed Subi East development dollars and over what time frame? The Leader of the House. President, thank you. And I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, Bob Port College has priority access to use Subiaco Oval for student recreation. Uh, during school hours. In addition, the Department of Education recently constructed eight basketball courts on land between Subiaco Oval and the college. Two to three, following the strong advocacy of the member for Nedlands, the member for Perth and the member for Churchlands, the government has committed to install two new pedestrian crossings in the area to improve pedestrian safety. Four, Subi East is expected to attract some $1 billion in private sector investment over the next 20 years. President, I ask the business of the House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Yes, President. Leader of the House. President, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 170, asked by the Honourable Donna Farragher to me, the Minister for Education and Training. Further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Um, Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Jorn Sidmer's question without notice 478, which was asked on the 11th of August 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into hand side. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, President. Uh, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 153, asked by the Honourable uh, Brad, Dr Brad Pettit, to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, that document is tabled. Um, and, President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answer to question on Notice 156 asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge on 16 June 2021 to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, will be provided on 7 September 2021. Pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answers to questions on Notice 155 and 160 asked by the Honourable Martin Aldridge on 16 June 2021 to me, the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health, will be provided on 16 September 2021. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The Minister for Regional Development. Um, President, I would like to provide an updated answer to the Honourable Steve Thomas's question without notice 464, asked uh, of me uh, in my capacity representing the Minister for Energy on 10 August 2021. An error, albeit of less than 1 per cent, has been identified in some of the information provided as part of the original response. Uh, the, answer to, the answer to one is unchanged from the re original response. For completeness, however, it is included in the revised answer below. Uh, the answer to two is slightly higher than was provided in the original response. The error is equal to less than one per cent of the uh, and the updated figures are attached. And I apologise to the House for the error. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? 
Uh, members, we move to uh, back to order of the day number 20, number 20, Financial Legislation Amendment Bill. And the question is the bill be read a second time. Oh, we're in committee. I should have asked the question. I had a question. Where are we at with it? I had put my notes to say where are we at with it, and I didn't answer. Good one. 